Engineering for Change, or E4C for short. Today we're really pre pleased to bring you the latest in E4C's 2012 webinar series. And today's webinar was developed in collaboration with Practical Action on the topic of Rio Plus 20, Sustainable Energy for All. Our guest presenters are Drew Corbin and Evan Thomas. My name's Gemma Hume, and I'll be moderating today's programme. When I'm not doing this, I work with Practical Action, where I am a communications officer. So I'd just like to take a moment now to tell you a bit about today's webinar, Rio Plus 20 Sustainable Energy for All. This is, of course, pegged to the coming Rio Plus 20 United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development next month in Rio de Janeiro, when world leaders, governments, the private sector, NGOs and global institutions gather to plot the path of, to sustainable development. Now, sustainable energy is essential for sustainable development, from powering economies to achieving the Millennium Development Goals, from combating climate change to underpinning global security. However, widespread energy poverty still condemns billions to darkness, to ill health, to missed opportunities for education and prosperity. That's why the UN has called for universal energy access by 2030. And to achieve this, we need to scale up successful examples of clean energy and energy efficient technologies, innovation that can spread throughout the developing world, partnerships with the private sector and visionary leadership. We're excited for the Rio gathering and really glad to have the opportunity to address some of these important issues here. And to do so, we've invited today's presenters to talk about some of the work they've been doing, particularly providing renewable, locally sourced, sustainable energy solutions which lift people out of poverty. Drew Corbin is an energy consultant with Practical Action Consulting, and Evan Thomas is Executive Vice President of Mana Energy Limited and Director of Portland State University Suite Lab. Drew and Evan, thanks ever so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Now, before we get going, I'd just like to take a moment to recognize the coordinators of the E4C webinar series generally. If, if this will, the slide will um, move on. Um, so the, so these, are, uh, these people are Jana Aranda of ASME and E4C and Holly Schneider-Brown and Alex Torres of IEEE. Thank you guys so much. Um, if anyone out there has any questions about the series, then please be encouraged to contact them via the email address visible on the slide, which is webinars at engineeringforchange.org. There you go. Okay, so before we hand things over to the presenters for today, we just thought it would be a really good idea to remind you about Engineering for Change, E4C, and who we are. So E4C is a global community of now over 10,000 technically minded individuals such as engineers, technologists, representatives from NGOs and social scientists who work together to solve critical humanitarian challenges, whether in water, energy, health, agriculture, sanitation or other areas faced around the world today. We invite you to join E4C by becoming a member. E4C membership provides cost-free access to a growing inventory of field-tested solutions and related information from all the members of our coalition, including professional societies like EWB USA and the IEEE, academic supporters like MIT's D-Lab, international development agencies like Practical Action, as well as access to passionate, engaged community working to make people's lives better all over the world. Now, registration is really easy and it's free, so please do check out the website engineeringforchange.org to learn more and to sign up. Okay, so I'd, um, I've got a message just to um, go back to the cover slide. So if I just go back to the beginning there, is that all right? Is everyone seeing, seeing that okay? Okay, cool. So I'll just go back to where I was. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly talk about Practical Action. Um, as I said, I work for Practical Action. It's an international development organization that uses technology to challenge poverty. 
Um, Practical Action has got a really unique approach to international development. We believe in the power of simple technology and smart thinking to transform the lives of some of the world's poorest people. And it's what we've been doing for, what, more than 45 years since we were founded by the economist E.F. Schumacher, who is the author of the revolutionary book Small is Beautiful, which many of you have probably read. Now, Schumacher believed in putting people's real needs at the heart of development. And that's the guiding principle that informs everything that we do today in our work across the developing world. And we find out what people are doing and help them to do it better. We enable poor communities to build their skills and knowledge to produce sustainable and practical solutions, transforming their lives forever and protecting the world around them. And, and by doing this each year, we help one million people to break out of the cycle of poverty for good. And you can find out more about the work of Practical Action by going to the website practicalaction.org. Okay, so the webinar that you're participating in today is, is one installment of the Engineering for Change webinar series. This free publicly available series of online seminars showcases the best practices and thinking of leaders in the field who bring leading edge technology and solutions to bear on global humanitarian and development challenges. Information on upcoming installments in the series, as well as archived videos of past presentations, can be found on the U4C webinars webpage, which is engineeringforchange-webinars.org. Now, EFC's next webinar will be in collaboration with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, AAAS and ASME.org, on June 13th at 11 a.m. EST. The topic is going to be Engineering for Human Rights, Opportunities, Risks and Responsibilities. And our presenter is going to be Jessica Windham, uh, Associate Director, uh, Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights and Law Program at the AAAS. And so if you want to uh, register for that, then just go to uh, tinyurl.com forward slash E4C webinar. Okay, so just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, so let's just see where everyone is from today. Uh, so in the chat window, can you just type in your location? Okay, so we've got someone in there from, from New York, welcome. And someone there from Colorado, hi. Anyone, um, oh, Wisconsin? Um, we've got someone in from Korea. And welcome to Beth Bradley, who's in from Toronto, Canada. In Winnipeg. Okay. And we've got someone from Ohio, Washington. Ah, someone even from from Belgium. Well, welcome everybody. We're really pleased to have you here today. Um, now, if you've got any technical questions or administrative problems, um, you should go to the chat window and, and feel free to send a private chat to, to Holly or Jana. And you can also use the chat window to type any remarks you might have. Um, during the webinar, you can also use the um, Q&A window at the, located below the chat window on the bottom right just to type in your questions for the presenter. And if I can just ask you, um, if you're asking a question, can you make it clear which presenter it's for? It will just help us to um, direct those questions to the right person. Um, and if you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, just try hitting the stop uh, button and then start again. And if that doesn't work, you can then use the call-in number for the teleconference. And you may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. And following the webinar, um, to request a certificate of completion um, showing the professional development hour, PDH for the session, then please provide your full name and date that you completed this webinar, as well as the code that we're going to give you at the end of the session. And uh, you can send this to eab-ceuadmin at ieee.org. So I should just go back. There it is. Point three, eab-ceuadmin at ieee.org.
Okay, so um, we'll get straight into it. Today's first presenter is Drew Corbin. He is an energy consultant with Practical Actions Consulting Arm, Practical Action Consulting. Um, Drew graduated in engineering and he's developed his career in the energy access field. He's spent significant time working in developing countries, including the Philippines and Nepal, with local organizations on rural energy projects using appropriate technology. Uh, today, Drew's going to be discussing the role of energy in challenging poverty, presenting Practical Action's recently launched Poor People's Energy Outlook, uh, which supports the 2030 goal of universal energy access by better, um, helping to better define the dimensions of energy poverty and the range of solutions needed in order to combat it. Uh, now, you can find out more about um, this Poor People's Energy Outlook report at practicalaction.org forward slash PPEO 2012, and, and Drew will um, also make a note of that later on. So um, Drew, um, I'm handing the power over to you if you want to start on your presentation. Thanks, Gemma, and many thanks to Engineering for Change for inviting me to present today. Uh, it's great to have such a large audience of people interested in engineering and development coming together from all around the world. We are now have 74 attendees uh, representing many different countries and regions. So, yeah, welcome to the presentation from Practical Action. Engineering for Change has organized this webinar series to discuss some of the hot topics that will be discussed at the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit this June. And I'm going to talk about energy, and more specifically, how we define energy to enable human development and what practical action are doing to bring energy access to people living in developing countries. Now, 20 years on from the first Rio Earth Summit, the global energy system remains in crisis. An array of cha challenges face sustainable development. In the face of rapidly increasing demand for energy from all corners of the world and fears about the security of our energy supplies, the provision of energy is causing catastrophic climate change, whilst the lack of modern energy is holding back development for the world's poor. 1.4 billion people in the world remain without electricity, and nearly 3 billion people rely on traditional biomass for cooking, most of whom still cook on an open fire. And the current rate of progress on these issues is still painfully slow. The number of people cooking and using biomass is actually increasing as we speak. And as a direct result, 1.4 million people die every year from the results of smoke pollution in the home, which is more than the number of deaths from malaria. Now, for human development, it is widely recognized that energy is a fundamental prerequisite. So, at Rio Plus 20 this year, the UN Secretary, Secretary General is hoping to formalize commitments to the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. And I've um, put the logo up here and the, the three targets. It's aiming to get member governments, business leaders, and civil society to sign up to the three targets for transforming the global energy system, all three of which should be achieved by 2013, with 2012 as the baseline year. Now, whilst these three objectives reinforce each other in many instances, the target of most interest for people who are looking at poverty reduction is the target of universal access to modern energy services. And many people are questioning whether it's realistic to aim for a target of universal access to, to modern energy services in only, what, 18 years. And we'd, uh, we'd like to ask you what your opinion is. So there is a poll function on this WebEx chat and if you go to the right-hand side chat tab uh, of your, the right-hand side of your screen, there is a little tick above the word chat. And there's a drop-down menu, and you can click yes or no in response to the question, is universal access to energy achievable by 2030? If I can ask all the participants to put in their thoughts, whether they think yes, it is achievable, or no, it isn't. Um, I'll give you just uh, maybe 15 seconds to have a think about that and put in your response, and we can have a look at what the feedback is. 
sorry, can I ask you not to write yes or no in the chat tab, but to vote using the tick box function at the top of that window? We have 20 participants of than this, 25, 29, okay, just 10 more seconds to put your vote in, please. Okay, so in the feedback form, we have had 36 participants, of which 20 have said yes, and 16 have said no. And also in the chat function, we have, I haven't counted how many yeses and noes, but it's also mixed. So, yeah, a, fair, a fairly mixed response on whether people think, that, think it, it is possible to achieve universal access to energy. A practical action. We believe this target is achievable. Certain countries, such as Brazil, China, and Vietnam, have made incredible progress in the previous two decades. And they've shown that with political will, rapid progress towards universal access to modern energy services is possible. But when we're considering universal access to energy, there are in practice two important issues here. Firstly, what do we mean by energy access? And secondly, how do we go about trying to achieve it? At the moment, there is actually no internationally agreed definition on what is energy access. So when we have a target of achieving energy access, what does this mean? And how do we know if we're going to get there? But more importantly, how, how we define energy access determines how we approach tackling energy poverty. And this definition will influence how billions of dollars are spent in chasing this target in the next two decades. Currently, the most important, the, the most widely cited definition of energy access focuses on energy supply in terms of connection to a grid electricity and the use of modern, modern fuels in the home. But practical action don't agree with this de definition. We think that such definitions imply a binary between people that they have a grid connection and people that don't have a grid connection. And this, this binary, this black and white, simply does not exist in most people's experience of energy access. This binary disguises a continuum of uh, varying quality um, when thinking about reliability, affordability, convenience, and health impacts that are associated with different energy supply realities. And it also ignores a large number of appropriate technologies and supplies that are important for people living in poverty. Furthermore, a disconnect exists between people having access to an energy supply and those same people realizing improvements to their lives. For example, there are many instances where a household is connected to the grid and considered having access to energy, but the people are only using a single light bulb, so they do not fully benefit from the wide range of energy applications, such as refrigerators, mobile phones, or even improved cooking technologies. So we feel if you just concentrate on this narrow uh, definition of uh, energy supplies being access to energy, then it's missing out on the, the real development benefits that can be realized from access to energy. So it's, it's for this reason that practical action is advocating for a definition of energy access that measures how people actually use energy. And the, the way people use energy is what we refer to as uh, energy services. And in the two reports I've shown on the right, the Poor People's Energy Outlook 2010 and 2012, we've explored the role of energy in achieving the different development goals which we are aiming for. And again, this is on our, uh, the Practical Action website. Gemma said it earlier, but again, it is www.practicalaction.org forward slash PPEO 2012. Uh, 
there's a message in the chat saying that uh, the sound is not clear. Can I ask if that is improved and people, or whether people are having difficulty hearing me? If you can just write in the chat whether it's clear or not. Okay, it seems clear. Thanks very much for that. I've also just put in the, the URL to the PPEO. But we, we also realize that you can't access energy services without a supply. So we're also advocating for a definition of energy access that includes a range of supply technologies. So we don't just have with grid electricity or without grid electricity. Um, we've developed a, an index, an energy supply index, that considers the continuum of energy access that moves from very poor supply through intermediate technologies to a high quality modern supply that many of us experience here in, the, in Europe and the US. Now this slide shows a simplified index for electricity supply. We've also developed a supply for household fuels and for mechanical power, which you can read in the Poor People's Energy Outlook report. You can see here how the index shows the, the, the basic or traditional technologies, if you like, moving through intermediate options to the modern supply of a full grid connection. We believe that small-scale and decentralized technology have a massive part to play in improving energy access for many of the world's poor. It's unrealistic to expect that many people will jump straight to a, the full quality of a grid connection and that they progress their energy supply situation through these intermediate technologies who, uh, as a group of um, mainly engineers, I'm sure we're all, all familiar with the solar panels, small wind turbines, Microhydro systems, etc., that uh, may form these intermediate technologies. But further research and development is really needed in improving the quality and driving down the cost of these pro poor technologies. So I think, you know, as engineers that are interested in development, you know, we should take a, an active interest in, in developing some, some of these technologies with a pro poor focus. Now, practical action has taken these principles of access to energy services and access to a range of energy supplies to develop the concept of total energy access. We're proposing the total energy access concept as a definition that should be adopted by the Sustainable Energy for All initiative. We've worked with Energypedia to develop the total energy wiki. The total energy wiki is an online energy data collection platform. It uses a total energy access framework to allow you to measure the energy access situation for households in developing countries that moves away from this conventional binary idea of energy access. Now, anyone with access to the internet can access this questionnaire and participate in and contribute to collecting data on energy access in a different way. And I'd, I'd really encourage anyone that's listening to that's working on energy access in developing countries to explore this site and get in touch with myself and Practical Action if you're interested in, uh, in contributing uh, energy access data. We would be very glad to hear from you. Now, I'd just like to give a few examples of Practical Action projects that are working towards increasing energy access. This photo shows the weir of a microhydro system in Kenya. This microhydro system generates 18 kilowatts of power and serves 300 households as well as businesses in the village. This system is a, a long way from any uh, from any grid supply. I think the the nearest transmission line is many kilometres away. So this system is is working independently of the grid and delivering modern energy services to the community who need it, who prior to that were relying on the expensive grid extension to reach their home. And frankly, they had 
they had no hope of uh, gaining that access in recent years. So this system has had a big impact on the lives and the livelihoods of the people in the village. <coughs> and the best estimates suggest that 55% of people in sub-Saharan Africa with, who are without electricity, mini grids like this decentralized from the main grid transmission system will be necessary to um, or the most viable option for gaining electricity. So that's 55% of people without electricity at the moment, mini grids such as this are the best option. But current levels of finance and interest are way below what is required to ensure that mini grids like this using micro hydro, solar PV or small wind renewable technologies, the finance is way behind what is required to achieve universal energy access. <coughs> and furthermore, the vast majority of this finance, uh, which is invested in energy development, goes to grid extension, which largely serves the cities and bypasses the poorest people who need it. This is a photo of charcoal production in Kenya using the traditional buried earth techniques. Now, many hundreds of millions of people uh, cook using charcoal in the developing world, and the supply systems rely on traditional technologies and inefficient market systems such as this to deliver their energy supplies. And this leads to widespread environmental degradation, as well as making cooking unaffordable for many of the poorest people. The charcoal kiln in this photo will produce about 10 kilos of charcoal for every one 100 kilos of wood burnt, which is uh, frankly a, a very inefficient technology. And there are much better technologies available out there if people can have access to them. And what practical action have um, been doing to help improve this situation in Kenya? We worked with all of the people in the charcoal supply chain, from the foresters to charcoal producers, transporters, retailers, and consumers, to draw up this market map, which highlights how they do business and some of the problems that they face. And from doing this exercise, we found that charcoal producers didn't have the skills or the technology to make charcoal more efficiently. Also, they couldn't access the finance to be able to afford the new, the new kiln, and they didn't have the permits. So this was really sort of encouraging unsustainable practices. But furthermore, all of the, the policies and regulations were also negatively affecting this market. Now, for universal energy access to be achieved, we really need to support markets that will supply energy supplies and energy equipment. So it's approaches like this that consider the systems which will deliver these supplies, that, uh, that practical action are focusing our efforts on to help improve, to have the benefits to, to support people's increased access. Uh, another area that we're working on is uh, recognizing that for universal energy access, we need um, many more organizations and many more people with the capacity to work with renewable energy for development. So we worked with Christian Aid and Oxfam to produce this interactive renewable energy toolkit, the IRET. It's a guide for people who are wanting to learn more about renewable energy for development. And it uses an interactive software and multimedia products to make the information much more accessible and interesting for a wider audience. And this, this IRET, the Interactive Renewable Energy Toolkit, is available for free on the Practical Answers website. So you can follow the URL there or just Google Practical Answers or Interactive Renewable Energy Toolkit. So these are three areas that Practical Action are looking at, both the finance, the policy, and the capacity aspects which are important for achieving universal energy access. And that's all I have a chance to talk about today, but I'm very interested and uh, looking forward to people's reactions and contributions at the end and interested to hear and try and answer some of the comments. Please go onto the Practical Action website, email myself, or if you're interested in the Social Energy Wiki, follow that link. Thanks very much.
Great, thanks Drew, I uh, really appreciate that. Now if anyone's got any questions for Drew, um, if you just want to pop them in the Q&A box on the bottom right hand side of your screen, and if you mark them for Drew, um, so we know that they're for him, and we'll be able to answer them at, at the end. So if anyone's got any burning questions, then, then get them in there now, and uh, so I can have a quick read while, um, while our next presenter is on. So our next presenter um, is Evan Thomas. Now um, Evan Thomas is is uh, an assistant professor and director of the Sweet Lab and a faculty fellow in the Institute for Sustainable Solutions at Portland State University. Evan's research and teaching interests include developing sustainable life support systems for spacecraft and the developing world. Evan is also a social enterprise executive uh, as the founding executive vice president of MANA Energy Limited. And prior to joining PSU, uh, Evan worked as a civil servant at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas for six years. And at NASA, um, Evan was principal investigator and project manager in the life support and Hability systems branch, working on concepts for sustainable moon and Mars spacecraft. Um, Evan holds a PhD in aerospace, aerospace engineering sciences from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Evan will present how MANA Energy leverages carbon finance to allow larger scale distributions of energy technologies and creating opportunities for entrepreneurs and development practitioners in the process of developing sustainable energy projects. Furthermore, Evan's also going to touch on the monitoring of these programs in a more accountable way through his work at PSU with Sweet Lab. So, um, Evan, it's over to you. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks, Drew, for that overview of energy access. I'm going to spend the next few minutes talking a little bit more specifically about leveraging the energy access challenge in terms of addressing critical public health challenges in developing countries. I'm actually going to skip ahead two slides uh, to the World Energy Use slide to touch on some points that Drew made earlier. Uh, this is a little bit of a repetition from Drew, but just to contextualize the problem, the average world energy consumption is a little less than the equivalent of two tons of oil per person per year. Here in the United States, we use nearly five times the world energy average and nearly six times the energy consumption average in Africa, which is closer to half a equivalent ton of oil, although, as Drew mentioned, most of that uh, energy use is biomass use. There are still three billion people who use biomass for their daily energy needs, and the majority of those are, uh, that takes the form of firewood on, firewood or charcoal on open flames, three stone fires. This is both expensive and time consuming. Uh, wood or charcoal can be both the most expensive commodity that a family, that an average family has to spend money on, and it can take many hours during the day to gather wood uh, from rapidly depleting sources. And black soot, which is emitted from these inefficient three stone fires, is simultaneously one of the least one of the one of the most significant tr contributors to global warming, also least well understood and least well characterized, and a leading cause of illness and death, upper respiratory disease and pneumonia caused by smoke inhalation. So there is, as Drew touched on, a very significant unrealized economic growth and public health improvement that is associated with the current limited access to energy. I'm going to skip back two slides here to context, further contextualize that problem in terms of the international development community that is working to address these challenges. Uh, energy access is obviously one of them, but energy access also touches on lack of access to safe drinking water, safe forms of sanitation, communication, access to markets. They're all interconnected. However, with many development programs from the smallest uh, nonprofits or church groups through to USAID or DFID or GTZ, all the way through to the World Bank or intergovernmental aid, uh, overseas development aid, there tends to be a linear funding in these development programs. And as a result, there's a real challenge to actually measure sometimes even what the problem is, let alone which solutions are working and which solutions have ongoing challenges. So one thing that we focus on is, is the need, we believe there's a need for a more for a pay for performance model in international development where 
implementing agencies such as uh, MANA Energy or Practical Action all the way up through the World Bank are held accountable for the actual outcomes rather than the inputs. This uh, next slide shows that a little bit pictorially. So we have project implementers that have the money. They go and do various programs, water programs or energy programs, sanitation projects that are designed to improve energy access or improve sanitation or uh, otherwise address public health and economic growth. But there's very limited feedback from whether or not these programs are actually working. And right now the status quo is to do the gold standard for these types of studies is a randomized control trial, which can be very expensive. Uh, a step below that tend to be third party experts going in and doing survey work. And then a step below that, the predominantly implementing agencies will self-report project outcomes. And even if everyone's trying to do their best to report those objectively and honestly, there's still a significant bias, cost, and lag associated with these types of surveys. So what we do, I'm going to skip ahead one more. This, this, this also, these next few slides show a few different uh, ways to visualize the impact of, of this issue. This is net overseas development aid received per capita. Uh, so you can see, obviously, the usual suspects and regions are net recipients of foreign aid. However, in the past 40 years, that has not correlated to economic growth in these regions. Africa and Southeast Asia and Central and South America remain relatively stagnant. Uh, and in some cases, in some regions, are, the, the conditions are getting worse, while the United States, the European Union, China, Russia, India have been growing. Meanwhile, so, so it doesn't appear to – overseas development aid does not appear to correlate with economic growth, and there's very little statistical evidence of, of foreign aid resulting in actual development. Of course, there are many, many, many successful projects, but there are also many programs that continue to struggle with these uh, long-term challenges. However, on the next slide, you can see that there tends to be a correlation between economic growth and energy consumption. The United States is the single biggest current emitter and historic emitter of greenhouse gases. Obviously, the European Union has done significant uh, work to reduce their emissions, but it is still far exceeds many of the least developed countries and other developing regions. So there are two things that uh, we do to try to address this challenge, these two challenges. One is through Carbon Financed Enterprise, where we implement and we work with a variety of partners to implement carbon credit financed sustainable development programs. And I know we have a diverse group of people on the phone today, so I apologize if some of this is a little bit basic for some of you who may well already be uh, deeply engaged in carbon financing. But I will do a little bit of a primer on that. And then the other program that we're engaged in is purpose-built innovation, where we put instrumentation in place to try to get at some of these challenges and really identify what's working and what isn't. Now, many of you on the phone are engineers. Uh, this is engineering for change. However, as you know, there, is, there are not that many engineers who are engaged in international development. There's a great deal of depth in public health, in business, uh, in, in medicine, but there are not as many engineers on these programs as there are in other industries. And so instrumentation is not a new idea to an engineer, but it is a emerging and in many cases a new idea to a monitoring and evaluation specialist at the World Bank or at Mercy Corps, which is one of our partners here in the United States. So the United Nations Clean Development Mechanism is a treaty that was set up to address reductions in emissions over time, and it's essentially cap and trade where uh, countries have agreed to certain emission reduction targets and then devolve that responsibility down onto industry where those industries can buy and sell carbon credits to comply with their emissions targets. We use the clean development mechanism and adapt it for the last mile to address health issues, health and energy access issues in households in developing countries. And this has not been well uh, utilized for this purpose yet. The, the clean development mechanism is a $120 billion a year industry. 70% of it is in China, 20% of it's in India, less than 2% still is in Africa. And as we've seen, there are still significant sources of emissions and of, of energy use in 
least developed countries, in African regions, in other uh, developing areas. But there is a challenge in actually characterizing that use and characterizing the impact of the interventions in actually reducing emissions. On top of that, there is something called suppressed demand, which is used by us to adapt for uh, those users that are currently not using much energy, that are currently drinking untreated water instead of boiling or, or using inefficient cook stoves or don't have access to charcoal or to wood and have a demand for energy that's currently not being met. Mana Energy Limited is a social enterprise that we founded about five years ago that was tasked with combining the clean development mechanism with drinking water treatment, and we first targeted it in Rwanda. Uh, we are now the first and so far the only organization in the world to get United Nations carbon credits for the treatment of drinking water. The premise is that many people in Rwanda boil their drinking water. When we install a water treatment system that reduces that use of firewood to boil the water, that results in a measurable reduction in emissions. We generate carbon credits under the UN, and then we sell those, in our case, to the Swedish government to comply with their targets. And then we reinvest that cash back into our programs. And again, this is, touches on the pay for performance model where we don't actually see that revenue until we've actually demonstrated that our water treatment systems are working and that our people are using this, them. Now, part of the challenge here, as I mentioned earlier, is that we use a concept called suppressed demand in many cases, which uh, can be controversial. Back to Rwanda. It is true that many people boil their drinking water, but it's also true that many, many, many more people don't boil their water. They don't do, use any form of treatment. They don't chlorinate it. They don't filter it. They don't have access to any treatment method that is viable for them, and instead they drink untreated water. This is contributing to the statistic that still over a billion people lack access to safe forms of drinking water, uh, that 5,000 children die every day around the world from diarrheal diseases that, are, that can be traced back to contaminated drinking water. So when we use suppressed demand, what we mean by that is that these individuals, these households, have a demand for energy use in this context to treat drinking water that is not being met by the lack of access to fuel, by the lack of access to improved stoves, uh, by the lack of, of time to collect the wood. And therefore, we're able to earn carbon credits based on the reduced demand for that energy use. And in essence, address that access to energy in a small way, not by providing the access to energy, but providing an alternative technology that meets the demand for the energy. Uh, this is a concept that we didn't make up. This was, this was uh, proposed by the United Nations Development Program and has been slowly integrated over the past five years into the clean development mechanism. It's also applicable and used for lighting programs and for cook stove programs as well as water treatment. In Rwanda, oh sorry, before we get to that, I, can't, this is a, I won't go through the details on this slide, but this is a business investment. We're able to take commercial loans, uh, commercial equity investments, develop the programs, implement our water and our cook stove, our water filter and cook stove programs, and then repay those costs to the investor over a period of years through the revenue that's generated from the carbon credits, while also using that revenue or a portion of it to reinvest in the ongoing operation, maintenance, and most importantly, education around the proper use and uh, performance of these technologies. Typically, it is a few years longer than a uh, typical commercial investment, maybe three to as long as seven years, uh, depending on the design of the program. However, it does mean that we're able to use commercial strategies and commercial sources of funding rather than looking for grant dollars. So in Rwanda, we're doing this now with a company called Del Agua. Del Agua has made a $50 million investment that MANA Energy is responsible for implementing. We're going to be distributing over 600,000 water filters and 600,000 high efficiency cook stoves to the entire western province of Rwanda. It'll cover roughly 3 million people with access to improved stoves and water filters. But really, the distribution is just the first start. We, we do it all through the Ministry of Health. Uh, it's done as a, as a public health campaign through Mini Sante uh, and their community health worker program. But 
through the revenues that are generated, we're able to set up permanent education and maintenance facilities to ensure ongoing performance of the program. We've done this once before with Vestergaard Franson, which is a company that makes a water filter called the Life Straw. Vestergaard put up $30 million of their own money and their water filters, nearly 900,000 of their water filters that have now covered 90% of the western province of Kenya. And there are now 4.2 million people who at least have access to one of these water filters. Now, access is the easy part. Ongoing usage, adoption, proper maintenance, uh, reduced use of fuel, measuring that adoption rate, measuring that reduced use of fuel, measuring that the crossover from other treatment techniques is the hard part, and it's a 10-year commitment at minimum. Uh, Vestergaard Franson has set up over 32 district maintenance facilities in each of the districts in the western province of Kenya. They have 2,000 community health workers that work at least part-time for Vestergaard Franson. Well, they work for the Ministry of Health, but they work to support uh, the Life Straw Adoption Program, going door-to-door -door every six months to look at adoption rates and ongoing uh, education challenges. So the other the other piece of what we do is actually measuring whether or not these types of projects work. There are projects that are, you know, the, the, the smallest Engineers Without Borders program going and doing a solar lighting program all the way up to this large scale Vestergaard France and water filter project. But everyone in between and at all ends of the spectrum are challenged to actually demonstrate success. It's, it's difficult. You send enumerators out in the field and you ask, are people using that life straw? Are people using that cook stove? You can do certain things like a randomized control trial. You can look at if there's water in the filter or in the bucket. You can test it for coliforms or you can test it for chlorine residual. But at the end of the day, there's still a courtesy bias. There's still a observer bias built in. And even if you're able to control for those biases, enumerators are expensive and experts are expensive, and these kinds of surveys happen infrequently. As I mentioned earlier, it's not a new idea to an engineer to use instrumentation to tell them how a program is doing. I'm, I, I'm here in Portland, Oregon. We don't check Portland's water supply or energy supply by survey of 100 homes once every six months. We have instrumentation that 24-7 are telling us the quality of the water, the quality of the air, the quality of the energy. We're trying to inject that same type of technical rigor into international development programs. And a key point here is that through better data gathering, through more objective data collection and more continuous data collection on energy access, on adoption rates of technologies designed to address public health and energy challenges, we're able to report back to funders who are otherwise reluctant to invest in these types of programs. So we have two components. We call it Sweet Data and Sweet Sense. Sweet Sense is the hardware, and then the data is all available through our Sweet Data platform. This is a version for cook stoves. We can measure usage rates of high-efficiency cook stoves. We can uh, measure thermal efficiency. We can measure CO and CO2 emissions in the kitchen. We can actually differentiate between stoves, which is one of the big challenges with stove programs. We can actually tell if somebody's using their three-stone fire versus their kerosene stove versus their charcoal stove versus their high-efficiency biomass stove. And we can evaluate adoption rates and change in performance of these technologies over time and ultimately use instrumentation as the sampling method for carbon finance programs uh, where right now, with, without a better alternative, the surveys uh, take that, the, the messy surveys are uh, the status quo. We have another version for household water filters. That's the life straw. We have those life straws in Kenya with Vestergaard, and we've adapted our sensors for the life straw to actually tell us frequency of use, volume of water, condition of the filter, time to end of life of the filter, which can be indicative of how dirty the water is in, in, in regionally. And again, this will help us measure in Rwanda the actual adoption rates of the water filters and the cook stoves over time. So our, our ultimate goal is to have verifiable performance measurements. We want to know how we're doing. We want to help other organizations know how they're doing in complying with these 
big challenges. Drew touched on what the critical challenges are out there. There are a number of solutions. There are a number of attempts, but we want to actually know what's working and what's not so that we can help invest in the programs that are most successful. And ultimately, we want to actually know energy usage rates. We want to actually know public health impacts to help inform the standards for development of further programs to continue to address these challenges. So thank you very much. Uh, my email address is up there, so feel free to email me, and I think we're happy to take questions. Great. Thanks, Evan. Um, yeah, so now we'd like to just open it up for Q&A. Uh, so if you can just use the question and answer window located below the chat window at the bottom right-hand side of your screen just to type in your questions for the presenters. And, and again, if you just make it clear for um, as to which presenter it's for, um, I'm going to kick off with one from um, from Michael Sanyo. Um, Drew, how is this all going to be presented? Um, oh, I've just lost it. Um, how is this going to be presented to national governments at Rio Plus 20? Okay. Thanks for the question, Michael. Practical Action will be uh, attending the, the Rio event. We will have a delegation over there, and we'll be looking to meet with as many people as we can and contributing to different fora and plenaries. And we're also working with, uh, in partnership with other civil society organizations to try and make our voice louder and uh, increase our influence where possible. But we're also, um, Practical Action are an observer to the Sustainable Energy for All high-level working group on universal access to energy, which is a, a space where we've been working hard to influence and you know have our voice and our position heard on this paper. So I think you know through influencing the Sustainable Energy for All initiative and the the meetings and the conversations they will be having, I think that's our you know strongest connection to um, to influencing the, the the course of events at Rio. Okay, thanks, Drew. Um, Michael, I hope that's answered your question. Um, so this is one for Evan. Um, paper performance seems to be a nice idea, but difficult to implement. Please can you explain how one can implement it practically? Sure, and, I, and I'm also reading through the other questions that have come in, so I can I can help address some of those. Uh, the paper performance, there's, there's a few different ways to implement that idea, and it's really an emerging idea uh, across the sector. The World Bank has set up an impact-based aid uh, program that's also tasked with looking at this same question. The bottom, the, the, the basic premise is that commercial investors or other donors can invest in a program, like it could be a carbon credit program or it could be more of a traditional aid program, but rather than the money coming on the front end from the ultimate financer, maybe the World Bank or USAID or DFID, that m money is put up at risk by the program implementer and they only receive repayment when they can demonstrate the, the compliance with the, with the, with, we, they can measure the impact of the program. Whatever the program is, if they say, if a project implementer says our goal is to get 10,000 CFLs out there and have 80% uptake, well, let's see how many CFLs get out there and what the uptake is and actually measure that. Uh, and this touches on, that question touches on another question here from Paul. It says, Evan, how do you select which parameters to monitor that will correlate with performance and success? And that's a really important point. We are not trying to define other people's performance or success criteria. Uh, and this is a conversation that's actually going on within E4C right now. We have a meeting about it next week in New York. Uh, my take on it is we're not trying to tell others right now what is the right way or the wrong way of doing something. Rather, program implementers in grants, in proposals, in carbon credit documentation, they articulate uh, either at the direction of a government or through community participatory development processes. At some point, they articulate what their goals are. Many of those goals can be measured. Many can't directly be measured, but many can be measured. So what we are trying to provide is a tool to help measure compliance with self-stated goals. Because what happens right now is organizations state their goals, then they go do their program, then they commission a study to have somebody go out there and say whether or not they've met that goal, but largely by survey or by enumeration. We're able to do it through instrumentation. And um, Gemma, I don't know, do you want me to go along with some of these other questions that are in here, or do you want to moderate them? 
Uh, fine. So, well, there's um, there's a question um, for you actually, Evan, um, from um, Jennifer Keller Jackson, who says, um, "Are these stoves and water filters in Rwanda being given away or sold?" Thanks, Jennifer, and, and good to see you on on the line there. These are actually being done as a public health campaign, which means we do give them away in the initial distribution. Uh, that has that's of course also controversial, but it's coming at the direct request of the Ministry of Health. We went to the Ministry of Health with this program. Uh, and said, you know, we can do these carbon finance distributions. We can either do it through a retail channels. We can do it through uh, communities in Rwanda. They're called uh, Madugadus, where the communities get together and they can put up money for community resources. And the Ministry of Health uh, directed us to treat this as a public health campaign, similar to other campaigns that are done in the region around condom distributions or vaccinations uh, or education materials around sanitation. So it's a hybrid model between the initial free distribution done through the Ministry of Health and through the district hospitals, and then the ongoing repair and replacement costs are subsidized by the carbon credits, but we plan to have at least a nominal contribution from the families uh, as a way to measure adoption rates, as a way to measure compliance or, uh, or uh, acceptance of these technologies. And also as a way to help build a retail market. Now, we have been criticized for doing giveaways on this scale by, uh, on the premise that perhaps that hurts a retail market long term. The difference here is the Ministry of Health has requested this as a public health campaign, and that's the format we're following. Plus, we're able to reach far more in a far shorter period of time uh, in a campaign style rather than a phased rollout uh, in a retail model. Okay, um, and then can you also, someone's um, asked, what, um, what's the day of your presentation at Rio Plus 20? I think that's, I'm actually not going to be there. I think that's a question for Drew. Okay. Oh, okay. Drew, presentation at Rio Plus 20. Sorry, I, what was the question? Um, what's, um, what's the day of the presentation at Rio Plus 20? We will have a, a side event there, or a... Uh, I believe a presence in one of the side rooms, which I think will be uh, continuing for both days. Okay, and I know that um, Pratt's Collection is also working um, with uh, Bosch Siemens on um, on smoke hoods um, because obviously that's a, a great a great way of kind of reducing um, smoke inhalation that a lot of uh, people in the developing world are, um, are, are dying from. So there's going to be an installation there at, at Rio, and Pratt's Collection will be there along with with Bosch Siemens. So if you're if you're at Rio, then then come along and and see us there and find out more about uh, Pratt's Collection's work. Um, let's see, we've just got a few minutes left, so probably, uh, we'll just take one more question. Um, let's have a look. Uh, 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 and answered that one. Oh, yes. Um, in the presentation, you've not mentioned any aspect related to solar energy usage for cooking or uh, water heating. Why? Um, if I, uh, both of you want to answer that? Drew, do you want to go first? Sure, yeah. There's a number of good technologies for solar energy um, for cooking and water heating, um, which practical action are, are promoted and promoting and are interested in. Uh, quite simply, I didn't have enough <laughs> enough time and space to mention all of the different appropriate technologies. If you're interested in finding out more about that, there's um, a technical brief on the Practical Answers website, which I discussed earlier that has a lot more information about it. Um, yeah, particularly the solar thermal water heater is um, uh, an excellent technology which is you know, in, in widespread use in many countries and I think is very well, very appropriate for um, deployment um, in, in, in many more places. Okay, thanks. Drew. Um, Evan, did you want to answer that as well? Uh, well, I guess the same thing is true. You know, obviously the, the technologies that we're touching on, cook stoves and water filters, are only two of, of many technologies that are available, uh, and many of which can be viable under a carbon credit uh, and instrumentation uh, method. So we work with a number of other organizations to do this. Uh, we've worked in Rwanda with biogas generators, uh, with 
a variety of different types of energy and sanitation and uh, water technology. So I agree with Drew, it's, it's definitely viable. Great. Okay. Well, um, thanks, guys. Um, really appreciate that. I think we're we're going to have to close it there. But um, don't worry if we didn't ask uh, answer any of your questions, because we can keep a note of them and we can email the relevant people with with answers. Um, so just to say thanks ever so much, everyone, for attending. Um, we really appreciate it. We, we've uh, had a great time doing this webinar. And rem remember to tune in for the next month's webinar on June the 13th. Um, and you can find out more about the webinars at www.engineeringforchange-webinars.org. And if you've got any feedback, then please email us at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. Thanks ever so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day. Take care. Bye.